Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday, the Friday before the 4th of July. Do you all have big plans for the weekend? Uh, not much going on here, I guess. I will be in uh, uh, Fairdale for the parish service on Sunday, so that'll be nice to be with uh, everybody there. Um, and then I'm not sure about Monday because it kind of sounds like it's going to maybe rain, so we have to keep an eye on that. But it's an absolute beautiful day here today. I'm going to mow the lawn before it turns into a hay field again, uh, work on my sermon, and uh, just have another busy weekend because that's what I do. Uh, so God bless our farm and God bless all of you guys wherever you are today. So let's start out with our morning affirmations. I am important. Today is going to be a great day. The world needs me. Today I choose happiness and I believe in myself. Today is a new and fresh start. And today I will do my best. And today and every day I am God's child and he loves me. Amen, and praise the Lord for that. So, um, for our prayers, um, Kathy Nash requests prayers for her friend Celeste Kaliokoski. Um, we've prayed for her in the past as her cancer has returned. So please keep uh, Celeste and her family in your prayers. And also with that, um, Kathy wanted to share, she had her procedure Everything went well, and she doesn't have a lot of pain. So praise the Lord for that. She's really happy that she did uh, the procedure, and she thanks everybody for all the prayers. And along with that as well, we want to keep uh, Kathy and Daryl in our prayers for Daryl um, as he is going to be starting his chemo next week again, which causes his white blood to go down, uh, go down and uh, doesn't have much energy. So please pray for strength for Daryl on that and Kathy. Um, some good friends of mine from back home lost their mom. Um, Lori Evans and Deb Jensen lost their mom, Bev. Um, and Bev was just an absolutely wonderful lady. She worked at the newspaper for a year, Bev Alquist. Uh, so please keep that family in your prayer. Uh, Carla Mack asked for prayers as Holden will be having surgery soon. And then a week after Holden's surgery, she's going to be having a surgery too. So they need a lot of uh, strength and prayers and help and everything with everything going on because Carla's a big part with Holden there. Um, and then um, prayers continue for Earl Moan as he's still recovering from his surgery. He's in great spirits, um, which Earl always is, um, but please keep him in your prayers. Um, and then of course, everybody that I didn't mention um, that's in our minds and hearts that God knows needs prayers, he'll send them down. Uh, so for the acts of kindness, um, I read that Aiden, a police officer, seen a lemonade stand a couple little kiddos had a lemonade stand. And they went over and they bought a glass of lemonade and gave them a $20 bill and told them how proud they were of them. That is awesome. That is just so awesome. And then speaking of police officers, my friend from Minnesota gave a gift card to one of her police officers who she had encountered in the past. And, you know, normally the police officers, officers say, we, we can't accept that, you know. Um, but she went through that, you know, with round one with this guy. And this time he just took it and said, thank you so much. And she said, God bless. Uh, very fun. Um, I want to announce um, that Lynn Hildy from the Adams area, who lives in Park River now, will be celebrating his 81st birthday. And they are having a birthday party for him on July 5th from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. at 605 Hilltop Drive in Park River. Um, and that is where Lynn lives, and they're going to have that in the party room. So if you can make it, that would be great. I actually stopped by there yesterday and gave him his card, and I just uh, bought him one of those big things of cheese puffs, you know, 
um, such a great, great guy. Um, if everybody could be like Lynn, this world would be a better place, I tell you. Except he really hates it when the twins lose. <laughs> so um, I have a reading for you uh, that I found. I should have probably read this a long time ago. I'm sure somebody shared this with me. But on my flight from San Diego to Nashville today, sitting in the row next to me was a 96-year-old woman who hasn't flown in 15 years. For her birthday, she wanted to go to Kansas City to see her family, but she was scared of flying. She asked for this man's hand during takeoff and then hugged him again when experiencing turbulence. The, this gentleman, I should say, gladly took her hand, let her hold on to him, calmed her by talking to her and explaining everything that was happening and simply was that stranger there for her. He knew just what to do the entire flight to help. He helped her stand up to go to the restroom and watched her carefully walk down the aisle. He made, it made me smile the whole flight as he comforted her. This man was her flight angel. He held her bag, helped her get off the plane and into the wheelchair. And when she got confused wondering where her daughter went, she called her, her sister. Um... He stayed with her until she caught up with her daughter, who got separated from her. I walked away sobbing, happy tears, being so thankful for people like this wonderful human. She was so grateful that she wanted him to have her flight pretzels. Hats off to you, sir, for your kind heart and your compassion towards someone whom you've never met. I've never been so touched on a flight before. This truly made my week. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. So with that, let us pray. Dear God, please enlighten our mind with truth. Inflame our hearts with love. Inspire our will with courage. And enrich our life with service. Pardon what we have been. Sanctify what we are. And order what we shall be. Amen. Simple but sweet. Yes. So, my friends, today we move into Hebrews and James. Um, we'll be done by the end of the July, if not before that. Um, so, Hebrews, a superior covenant. Okay. And so, with that, let's go through the outline and the themes. 243 we are on. Page 243. And there's James, and here is Hebrews. Okay, so for the outline of Hebrews, we have the superiority of Christ over angels, Moses, and priests. Chapter 1 through chapter 7, verse 28. Then we talk about the superiority of Christ as the high priest of the new covenant. Chapter 8 through chapter 13. Wait, chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Then, the superiority of the new tabernacle, chapter 9, 1 through 12. The superiority of Christ's sacrifice, chapter 9, verse 13 through chapter 10, verse 18. A call of perseverance, faithfulness, and discipline, chapter 10, verse 19 through 12, verse 29. Here's a good one. Rules for Christian Living, mark this down, chapter 13, 1 through 17. And then a request for prayer, final greetings, and benediction, chapter 13, verse 18 through 25. And the themes, as you've probably figured out, are the superiority of Christ. Uh, because of Jesus' superiority, what Christians have is superior to the old revelation. Jesus and the New Covenant are superior to the Old Covenant, the Old Promises, the Old Sacrifices, the Old Promised Land, the Old Sanctuary, and the Old Priesthood. And then, Christ's humanity. Christ became flesh to defeat the power of death, sin, and evil, and to give true freedom. Because Jesus became flesh... We know that Jesus understands our weakness and provides us with the grace to be faithful to him. And last, 
faith, perseverance, and dis discipleship. Christ has given us a superior revelation and salvation. As a response in gratitude to him, we are called to endure persecution and suffering. We press on to our goal with faith in Christ to rest in God's presence for all eternity. Great themes, if you ask me. So the main purpose of this letter to the Hebrews was to establish a superiority of Jesus. Jesus is better than angels, the prophets of the Old Testament, Moses, the law, the old covenant, the priesthood, the tabernacle, and the Jewish sacrificial system. Jesus' death on the cross fulfilled the Old Testament. Jesus reveals God in a new and more complete way. You know, oftentimes, um, I'm going to talk here, but let my dog out. <clears throat> oftentimes, people will say, oh, you know, I'm going to really get into the Bible. I'm going to start reading. And of course, they start in the beginning with the Old Testament. Um, and before you know it, they're like, are you kidding me? I can't do this stuff. There's no way. And then they stop. <clears throat> but we must move on. In order to understand the New Testament, we have to understand the Old Testament. Because after uh, Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead, defeated death, he did this all for our sins. And it's my belief um, that God loves everybody. Um, we are all God's children, no matter what. Uh, we receive love through him and his love. Um, and so love is love. Um, and so tell your friends, and I want you to understand, that if you decide to get into the Bible and you're going through the Old Testament, don't give up because there's way more to the Bible than that. And um, and we just heard, you know, um, that um, Jesus is better than all of that in the Old Testament. I mean, the prophecies were fulfilled, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but God knows, even with the law, the Ten Commandments, that we aren't going to be able to follow them. I mean, he expects that. But he also does expect us to realize that and pray for forgiveness and repent our sins. So, um the letter aims to guide God's people into God's rest, his promised land, his new promised land. Um, this is a journey of faith. Now, faith is the stance God's people take as they persevere in confidence towards the goal. The letter urges all Christians to strive to be holy and to be like Jesus. I pray that every night. Help me to be more like Jesus. Suffering was the motivation for Christ's life of obedience and perfection. As imitators of Christ, suffering can help believers on their journey toward obedience in faith and love. Because what do we do when things are bad? We pray, right? And how often do we pray when things are good? We just let it slide and roll with it, right? But when things are bad, we often pray for God to help us and it brings us closer to him. It strengthens our relationship to him. The author of Hebrews um, is unknown, but however, some scholars suggest that maybe the Apostle Paul wrote it. But see, Paul identifies himself in all his other letters, but the author of Hebrews does not identify himself. And also the difference in themes and um, style between like Paul's letters and Hebrews argues against that Paul was the author. Uh, many scholars suggest a date from AD 60 to 69 for two main reasons. The author of Hebrews mentions Timothy and mentions the Temple of Jerusalem, which was destroyed in AD 70. And in the book of Hebrews here, it still appears to be standing. So the author speaks of the temple in the present tense and doesn't reference the end of the Old Testament sacrificial system. He is writing to Jewish Christians because these converts appear to be tempted to resort back to Judaism or at least a hybrid version of Christianity um, mixed with Judaism. Some scholars suggest that the recipients of Hebrews were the large number of priests 
who converted to Christianity after the selection of the seven deacons that's mentioned in Acts 6. Now, because most people assume that the audience of the book was Jewish, the book came to be called the letter to the Hebrews, to the Jews. Okay, Hebrews, Jews. So Judaism is kind of confusing. I looked it up for a proper explanation. Um, and Judaism is a complex phenomenon of a total way of life for the Jewish people comprising theology, law, and innumerable cultural traditions. Now, they believe in the one true God that appeared to Abraham and Moses and all that. But Judaism combines that with um, the cultural traditions of the Jewish culture, um, which is not, um, does not come from God. So that's what Judaism is. Now, this group of Christians were facing fierce persecution at the time. The persecution from the Roman, Roman government probably was not the only people that they were receiving persecution from. They might have experienced persecution from the other Jews because of their beliefs. Now, during the first century, Judaism was a protected religion under the Roman law. <clears throat> Christianity, though, was not. The pressure of the persecution must have made it tempting for Christians to return to their Jewish roots in order to avoid persecution and the possible death from the Roman government, you see. So some scholars believe that in certain areas in the first century, when Jews converted to Christianity, they were banned from the synagogue and their children could not attend the synagogue schools either. Um, so anyway, there's a bunch of heroes in Hebrew 11. Okay, and I'm just going to read their names. I'm not going to tell you uh, where they're at because you guys will know where to find them. But they talk about these heroes here. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel. So where are all these heroes from that they're being talked about in Hebrews 11 in the New Testament? They're from the Old Testament. And <clears throat> these people all had prophecies. And they are referenced in Hebrews 11. Um, so that would be really interesting uh, for you to read because I read that and it was really neat. Um, God's promises of saving and transforming the world are made complete, we know, in Jesus Christ. Now, throughout the history of the Bible, heroes of faith, like we just talked about, persevered through great trials and difficulties. And these heroes provide us with insight into God's providence and faithfulness. Now, throughout the book of Hebrews, the author gives five warnings to all believers. Are you ready? Pay attention to everything you hear. I might add to that, don't believe everything you hear, but pay attention to everything you hear. Fight against unfaithfulness and the hardening of your hearts. Grow in spiritual maturity. Persevere through trials and suffering. And never, ever refuse the Holy Spirit. You could put them on your refrigerator to look at every day, right guys? Well, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of every promise that preceded him and is superior to anything that came before him. In Jesus, we have a better hope, a better promise, a better sanctuary, and a better inheritance. Jesus is the supreme and superior mediator, the sinless high priest. There is no longer a need for repeated sacrifices because Jesus is the one and only sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice provides all who believe to him access to the holy God. Here's an interesting fact for you guys. The phrase better than appears 13 times in the book of Hebrews. And what this means is, number one, Jesus is better than anything. But it goes on to say Jesus is better than the prophets, angels, Moses, Joshua, high priest, Abraham. Um, how do you pronounce that again? Melchizedek, Aaron, and priests and sacrifices. So here are some lessons that we can take from the book of Hebrews. First of all, God speaks, so we must listen. 
long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he had spoken to us through by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. That's in Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2. Now this introduction to the book foreshadows one of the themes, the superiority of Jesus Christ. But it also reinforces that God did speak through the prophets prior to the incarnation. As Jesus' followers, we often place the Old Testament writings on a lower level than New Testament writings. But however, as these verses make clear, God spoke through the prophets. And we must learn to listen to those words as well. As we must account for context, we must also embrace content. Every book of the Bible has lessons that must be applied for our spiritual health. Next, faith matters. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Hebrews 11, verse 1, gives us the classic definition of faith. The assurance of all things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, if we are following Jesus, my friends, this is the reality that we live in. Things hoped for and things not seen, right? We must believe that God is in ultimate control no matter what the circumstances of our lives are. We have all seen and experienced suffering, loss, and unexplainable tragedy. Yet our faith compels us to continue to follow and believe. Faith molds the way we think, the things we say, and how we act and react, and it really, really matters. Next, authority is essential. Um, Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls and those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. When God's people submit to the authority that Christ has established, it becomes joy. But again, pay attention to everything you hear. Now we move on to the book of James. It's a test of a living faith. That is the, the main theme for that. So in the outline of James, <clears throat> um, chapter 1, greetings. Um, test of living faith is in chapter 1, 2 through 18. Faith tested by its response to the word of God, chapter 1, 19 through 27. Faith tested by its reaction to favoritism, chapter 2, verse 1 through chapter 13, er, excuse me, verse 13. Faith tested by its doing of good works, chapter 2, 14 through 26. Faith tested by its production of self-control in speech and humility. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. Faith tested by its reaction to quarreling, judgmentalism, arrogance, selfishness, and suffering. Chapter 4, verse 1 through chapter 5, verse 12. Faith tested by its resort to prayer. Chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. And the conclusion, the rest of the way through the book. Um, good book to read. Good book to read. And themes here are temptation and maturity. The Christian life is faced with many temptations in this world. However, for James, temptations are tests that strengthen our faith. Wealth and poverty. The book of James does not condemn wealth. Rather, just like other biblical texts about riches, it condemns the abuse of use of wealth. That is, James condemns two attitudes towards money, an attitude that abuses or ignores the poor, and when riches are substituted for God and become an idol. Yep. Sins of speech. Self-control is an important feature of true faith. Our speech can be a source of great goodness or great evil. Patience and prayer. Prayer becomes a test of faith when it requires patience. 
The patience James writes about is born from a great dependence on God, which is born from wisdom. And last, faith and actions together. James writes about the faith of those who have already been saved. It is a visible faith, a faith shown in deeds rather than words. And you remember, uh, faith without action is a no-go. Okay, so now this letter emphasizes faith, as you've heard, testing, wisdom, and doing. The letter of James is concerned with helping readers see the importance of living faith. The message of the book is very, very clear. Go and do good things for others rather than just talking about it. The book of James was written to Christians who had become arrogant. Its message is different from Paul's letters because Paul dealt with one of the many or one of the problems new Christians faith, the belief that they can earn God's grace by being good enough. Can't earn God's grace. Paul concludes, for it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. In this book, James deals with the other side of the problem, a misunderstanding about grace that results in the inact of faith. In James 2 verse 17, it says, in the same way, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. That's another one to put on your refrigerator, guys. Because of his prominent role in the church, many scholars agree that the author of this book was James, the Lord's brother. James, the Lord's brother. Now, Jesus' brother, James, initially was not a follower when he was alive. But he later, or excuse me, a follower of Jesus when Jesus was alive. But he later believed and became an important leader in the Jerusalem church. Interesting, huh? So Paul wrote upon his first visit to Jerusalem as a Christian. Um, it's in Galatians 1 verse 19. And that's why they believe that uh, this book was written by Jesus' brother. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. According to early tradition, James was martyred in Jerusalem in A.D. 62. Now, the letter was likely written before the Jerusalem Council in A.D. 49. The main reason for this thought is that the Gentile Jewish controversies that caused the Jerusalem Council are not mentioned in this letter. In addition, the letter demonstrates a strong Jewish background but with special familiarity with Jesus' teaching. For example, the letter uses the word synagogue instead of using the church. So a question for you is, do you notice the timing of this book, James? Let's say compared to the book of Hebrews that we just talked about. This is telling us uh, that the book of James was actually written before Hebrews, right? Um if I'm not mistaken, because it's AD, four, let's see, AD 49, and um, Jesus' brother James was martyred in 62, and Hebrews, their thinking was written 62 to 69. And so that is another thing that makes the Bible hard to follow, is it's not all in chronological order. So, although impossible to say for sure, our best guess is that the letter was meant for Christian Jews. And one of the reasons for this guess is found in the expression, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, it's quoted. Now, scholars identify these 12 tribes with Christian Jews, Gentiles, all Christians, both Gentiles and Jews. James is a strong reminder to all believers that faith must produce good fruit with appealing images, a compassionate heart, and strong advice, James urges Christians to live out their faith. We must display a living act of faith, my friends. Faith without good deeds is constricted and unable to grow. Our faith must be visible in our self-control, our maturity, 
our treatment of weak people in society, and prayer. So what do we learn from this little book of James? Well, there's a lot of lessons. I love it. I think it's, uh, I think it's a must read here for you guys. Um, so James leads us on a journey of how to live out our Christian life. He was writing to first century Jewish Christians, and the same principles apply to Christians today. It focuses on practical actions and answers to life problems that we will all encounter. James tells us that we can't just talk about our Christian faith. We have to show it with our actions. Some call this book the how-to book on Christian living. Read it. James wastes no time getting down to business here. He was writing to support the scattered and persecuted early believers. James wanted to encourage them in their faith during their difficult church times. And he gets right to the heart of the issues, and here's what he says. Trials and temptations, James 1, verses 2 and 3. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. That's hard for us to understand, but so true. Now, James's words could not be even more relevant to us today. Notice, James says, when you face trials, not if you do. Therefore, we should all expect them and know how to deal with them in a positive way. And none of us are immune to trials. We all experience travels. We live in an imperfect world with imperfect people. But instead of asking God, why is this happening? We need the strength and faith to say, what am I supposed to learn from this? This turns us away from the worry and stress and towards his peace. The pure joy that James mentions is not happiness in our trial but the perseverance and wisdom we learn through our hardship. It's also the joy of comfort that God is present with us in all of our trials and that we are never alone. That is so huge and it is so hard to do. But once we can do this, it just brings immense peace into our lives. Next is God's wisdom. Understanding our trials and sufferings of life is hard. But James tells us we can ask God all our questions. He doesn't want us stumbling through our trials alone. He wants to walk through them with us. Um, in uh, James 1 verses 5 through 6 it says, If any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks... He must believe and not doubt. One of our listeners just asked me um, how to find peace. And I just so hope you're listening right now. This is meant for you. Um, this is so meant for, for you. So um, maybe take this book of Hebrews and James on, or these books. Wisdom is not just facts and information. Biblical wisdom is knowledge with the perspective of understanding what God wants us to do. James says, if we need help in making wise decisions, ask him. He knows best. And we must stand strong through our trials by focusing on what we know and believe. Jesus promises in Mark 9 through 23, everything is possible for one who believes. But it's got to come from the heart. It's got to come from your pure heart. It can't just come from the outside. Yep, I believe in Jesus. And that's it. Okay. The building blocks. Wait a minute. When our faith is strong, we can have all we need. The building blocks of a strong faith are in the scripture. And we need to read it to know it. Next, resisting temptation. Okay, in... Um, James, oh, I didn't put here something, verse 13, 14. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. Okay? For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one <clears throat> is tempted when? By 
his own free will and evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Wow, right? James wants us to know God never tempts us. Tests us? Yes. Tempts us? No. So what is the difference between a test and temptation? Testing is designed to help us understand our dependence on God and bring us closer to him. Temptations work just the opposite. They draw us away from him. God would never try to entice us to sin. Please know that. That comes from Satan who prowls around waiting to attack us in our weaknesses. Everyone faces temptation that leads to sin, but we need to take responsibilities for our actions. And you know I'm big on that, accountability. But we need to confess them and ask for forgiveness. We can't give Satan all the credit for our sins. Our own desires, our own free wills draw us away from God as well. Our fallen nature is something we will always have to fight against. We can resist temptation by knowing his word and choose to obey it with guidance and conviction of the Holy Spirit. And as I said, my friends, this is easier said than done, but we are troopers. We are the army of the Lord and we can do this. Start with the word. Amen. So, we don't have much left. Um, we obviously are not going to have coffee with Christ on Monday. Happy 4th of July to everybody. And you will have my sermon from Sunday. Um, next, let me look here. 251, 254. Let me see. First and second Peter. And first, second, and third John. I don't know if I can get both of these into uh, one session. So next we'll do first and second Peter. That'll be Wednesday. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, Wednesday. Okay, and then Friday I'm off again, and Monday I'm off. So then the following Wednesday will be one, two, and three John. Okay? Um, I have our family reunion next week. So Wednesday's good. Um, not Monday. Wednesday, yes. Not Friday, not Monday, the following Wednesday, yes. Follow Facebook. So with that, let us all join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So now, my friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon all of you and be gracious unto all of you. And may the Lord look upon each and every one of you in this whole entire world with his favor and give us all his amazing peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is a gift from God, my friends. That's why they call today the present. Make the most of this beautiful day because this is the day that the Lord has made and let us all rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, thanks so much for joining me. I hope you have a wonderful and blessed 4th of July Independence Day um, holiday. Be safe. Um, enjoy your friends and family. God bless you. And until next Wednesday, bye for now.